Oh, Zack Snyder. Truly, you and I have got a rocky history together. On the one hand, you've given me visually striking classics like Watchmen and 300, but on the other, you've delivered dour, cumbersome, convoluted garbage like Man of Steel, Batman vs Superman and Sucker Punch. And I've got to be honest here, it's starting to feel like your career has been more misses than hits, and you haven't made a decent movie in almost a decade. Then you came back from the wilderness and pulled off the seemingly impossible, redeeming the absolute disaster of Justice League with the long-awaited Snyder cuts. I mean, it wasn't perfect, that's for sure, and even your biggest fans would probably concede that it was too long and self-indulgent, but hey, it got the job done, I guess. So I was kind of interested to see what you'd do next, and with the announcement of Army of the Dead coming out on Netflix, I was pretty excited. I mean, it's got zombies, guns, and Las Vegas. There's not many ways you can fuck that up. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what a mess this movie is. An unholy conglomeration of ideas and concepts shamelessly ripped off from other, better movies thrown together into a lumbering Frankenstein's monster of a film that pretty much exemplifies all of Snyder's worst tendencies as a director. The clunky editing, the self-indulgent pacing, the awful dialogue and the dull, lifeless characters that all blend together into a generic mass of nothingness. It was a real slog to get through not helped by the abusively long runtime, but I did it so that the rest of you don't have to. And now, like a good bowel emptying shit, I get to vent my frustration. So let the defecation begin. <coughs> The film kicks off in the desert outside Las Vegas, with a military convoy transporting a really dodgy sealed container of some kind. But before you can see a contrived plot device, the convoy crashes into a car because the driver's busy getting a blowjob. <laughs> and the containment device has been breached. And wouldn't you know it, it just so happens to contain some kind of super powerful zombie thing that proceeds to massacre and infect the soldiers before heading to the nearby city. Pretty soon, the zombie virus kills or infects the local population and forces the government to seal off the entire city. I've never really understood why a military with tanks, ground attack aircraft, artillery and flamethrowers wouldn't be able to contain a force of slow moving walking corpses, but whatever. The upshot is that Vegas is now a no-go zone, scheduled to be wiped off the face of the earth with a tactical nuclear strike in a couple of days. This is bad news for shady Japanese businessman who's got hundreds of millions of dollars locked up in the vault of his casino. Naturally, he wants his money back before the nuke drops, so he recruits ex-soldier Dave Batista to retrieve it for him. I mean, I assume these characters have actually got names, but for the life of me I can't remember any of them. In fact, the entire cast is made up of so many generic stock characters that the best I can do is invent my own names and hope that they stick. Anyway, Batista's objective is to recruit a team of mercenaries, make their way to the casino on foot, crack the vault, get the money and fly it out of there on an abandoned chopper before the nuke wipes out the entire city. How's that for a slice of fried gold? Yeah, boy! Hmm, a small group of people under siege, relying on a single aircraft to fly them out of there before a nuclear explosion destroys the place? Where have I seen this before? Now, you might think it would make more sense to fly directly to the casino in a chopper, thus saving valuable time and avoiding the need to hike through a dangerous, zombie-infested city. You can't fly into Vegas. It's restricted airspace. Fair enough, I guess. But then, why exactly do you think they'd allow an aircraft to leave? Isn't that the whole point of a quarantine? To stop the infection spreading? Well, as J.J. Abrams would say, don't think about it, just look at the lens flare. For this plan to work, they need a pilot to fly the chopper. So Batista recruits Tig Nataro, a stand-up... uh comedian? Who for some reason has convinced herself she can act, although fuck me, you'd never know it from this movie. They also need a safe cracker to get into the vault, because even though shady Japanese businessman owns the fucking casino and the vault within it, they apparently can't get it open by themselves. Why? Don't know. Just pretend that this is some kind of clever heist film about a hand-picked team breaking into a high-security Vegas casino. Hmm, where have I seen this before? The point is, Batista recruits campy German guy to 
to handle this particular plot device, and honestly, the movie does everything except dress him up in lederhosen and show him munching on a bratwurst when we meet him. We get it, he's very, very German. Rounding out the crew is unreasonably hot smuggler lady who knows her way around the city, and shady Japanese businessman's henchman who's so obviously suspicious from his very first scene that if you don't immediately figure out that he's got an ulterior motive, then all I can say is you're probably the target audience for this movie. Oh, and there's also about a dozen other side characters that are so thoroughly irrelevant that I genuinely couldn't tell you a single thing about them. Take a wild guess which ones are going to die first. Remember Aliens? Remember how basically every character in that film was unique, well written and fleshed out, so you knew exactly who everyone was and what they wanted? Remember how that really helped you get invested in the movie because you actually cared about who survived and felt genuinely bad when they started dying off? That was nice, I liked that movie. And so did Zack Snyder, apparently. <laughs> anyway, moving on. So the team make their way into the quarantine zone, but oh no, they soon run into the Alphas, a group of super powerful smart zombies that basically run the show. Unlike the others, these ones are fast and strong, they hunt as a pack, and they're not too pleased that Batista and his red shirts have invaded their territory. But that's okay, because unreasonably hot smuggler lady does the sensible thing and sacrifices one of their group to appease the Alphas. And if Everyone just kind of stands there and watches in silence while he's dragged screaming to his agonising death. Wow, what a lovely group of people. Really hope these guys make it out alive. I mean, I know he's kind of an asshole and everything, but I really don't think it justifies this. Also, why would you just assume that giving up one person would cause the Alphas to leave you alone, instead of simply killing the rest of the group? Why is everyone okay with this lady betraying one of the team, knowing that she might do the same thing to them next time? Why don't they just use their overwhelming firepower to take out the lead Alpha, who's totally exposed and practically begging to be headshotted? Don't know. Anyway, the rest of the movie is pretty much what you'd expect. The team reaches the casino and campy German guy manages to crack the vault. But wouldn't you know it, shady Japanese businessman's henchman provokes the lead alpha by killing his girlfriend. Oh yeah, zombies can apparently form romantic relationships now. And then there's a big fight and pretty much everyone dies, and the movie culminates in a one-on-one -on -one fight between Batista and the lead alpha as a nuke goes off in the background. And he manages to kill it by shooting it in the heads. <laughs> Fucking really? This unstoppable monster that can shrug off automatic gunfire and high explosive shells, in the same way Ryan Johnson shrugs off valid criticism of his movies, dies from a single handgun shot to the head? How inventive. I guess we'll just forget about the countless characters that have shot him throughout the movie. You're seriously telling me that not a single one of them managed to score a headshot? I'd also like to point out that this final confrontation takes place in a fucking chopper. The movie's practically begging to have this guy sliced and diced in the rotor blades, but nope, a gun to the head is all we get. <laughs> And I guess when I really think about it, this pretty much exemplifies the lack of imagination that's gone into this movie. None of the plot points, characters, action sequences or revelations possess even a hint of originality. It all just feels like a mismatched combination of different ideas, liberally borrowed from other films, poorly stitched together and sloppily implemented. The emotional tone veers wildly between goofy attempts at gallows humour, cringeworthy dialogue that wishes it was sharp and insightful, and forced insincere moments of what Zack Snyder unironically calls drama. The problem here is that the funny parts are obvious and boring, and the supposedly serious bits are laughable. If you want an example of a far superior movie that manages to switch easily between comedy and pathos in the midst of a zombie outbreak, then go and watch Shaun of the Dead. Not only is the script, acting and direction far superior, but it's also edited in a way that doesn't make you want to shove two pencils up your nose and headbutt the table. Which brings me neatly along to another big gripe about this movie, the pacing. It's fucking awful. For some reason, Zack Snyder seems to confuse quantity with quality, and the end result of his love affair with slow motion and long drawn out establishing shots is that he's physically unable to produce tight, well edited movies. Army of the Dead is no exception, clocking in at nearly two and a half hours, and honestly, you could cut at least 40 minutes out of this movie and lose nothing of value. The story just isn't complicated enough to justify this kind of runtime 
time, and the reason it takes so long is because the guy just doesn't know how to end a scene. Death scenes that should be over in a matter of seconds stretch out into frustrating, tedious minutes. There's long drawn out sequences of the group moving through derelict buildings that adds nothing to the story, and dialogue that's scientifically calculated to be as clunky and inefficient as possible. Take this scene where the group pass through a mound of zombie corpses that have been desiccated by the desert sun, and one of them mentions that they reanimate when it rains. Cool idea, except it never does rain and the corpses never do anything. Well, thanks for giving us Chekhov zombies, Zack. And it's all shot in this weird, out of focus style where everything except the central character is more blurry than my eyesight after two bottles of toilet duck. <coughs> I really don't know why Snyder went for this effect, because all it does is add another little irritation to what's already a pretty frustrating movie. The situation isn't helped by the bloated cast of characters that never gets a chance to breathe or develop. Half the time I struggle to even understand or explain why certain people were there. Like Batista's daughter, who gets added to the group at the last minute, under the flimsy pretense of wanting to look for a friend inside the quarantine zone and threaten to go it alone if he doesn't let her tag along. Seriously dude, have you considered putting her under arrest, or locking her in a cell, or even knocking her out until the mission's over? I mean, I know she might be pissed at you and everything, but at least she'll be safe. The point is, there's a million different ways you could have kept her out of this, but nah, I guess we really needed that father-daughter reconciliation storyline. Like, if you really had to do this, then how about you just make her the safe cracker, or the smuggler, or the chopper pilot? You know, a skill that's vital to the success of the mission, which would have given her a justifiable reason for being there. Weirdly though, Dave Bautista himself is actually one of the less embarrassing aspects of this movie. I mean, wrestlers turned actors aren't exactly known for delivering Oscar-winning performances, and old Dave is no different. He doesn't have the confidence and charisma of guys like The Rock, but he's clearly invested in what he's doing, and whatever his acting shortcomings, he still has the kind of presence that only sheer physical size can convey. At the other end of the spectrum, Tig Nataro's in this film, and for the life of me, I can't understand why. She's about as funny as a terminal diagnosis, and she absolutely can't act to save her life. None of her reactions have the slightest connection to what's going on around her, and if I was a cynical man, I would say that she was awkwardly green screened into this movie after the fact because the original actor playing this character was removed for unspecified reasons. But what really boils my piss here is that I think there's a kernel of a decent idea at the core of this movie. Yeah, the setup might have been assembled from the scraps of other films, but it could still have been a perfectly decent backdrop for a fun, fast-paced, action-packed heist movie with a darkly comedic undertone. It could have done, but it all rested on having a decent script and a director that understands the kind of movie it was supposed to be making. Unfortunately, we got neither of those things. Instead of giving us a tight, punchy action comedy that gets the job done in 90 minutes, Snyder delivered a heavy, ponderous, slow-paced, wannabe epic whose jokes aren't funny and whose serious moments are impossible to take seriously. A movie that tries to straddle a bunch of wildly different genres, but lacks the skill and intelligence to properly integrate them into a satisfying story. In short, Army of the Dead is a movie that's probably not worth two and a half hours of your life. Speaking of which, it's about time for me to forget this shit show and make my eyes as blurry as Zack Snyder's camera work. <laughs> Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.